Uh, so the title of this, this segment of my research is uh, Do Non-Dual Claimants Score Higher Than Non-Claimants in Depersonalization and Dissociation? Um, this is a notoriously difficult area to, to study. Um, there's been a lot of theory, a lot of speculation. Um, Jeffrey has made a tremendous impact um, in empirical research, but it is, uh, you know, there's so long way to go. Um, so I'm really, really grateful to be a student at CIIS where I can study this sort of thing. I kept getting in trouble as an undergrad at Harvard, actually, for what I wanted to study. Um, so, so what is it exactly? And there's no really universally agreed upon definition. Um, this is the definition that I use for the purposes of my study. Um, you know, people complained about it. I got raked over the coals just yesterday by a Buddhist teacher for this definition. Um, so this needs a lot of work, but this is, this is what I use to classify people into claimants or non-claimants. It's having the persistent sense of not being a separate self and persistent rather than a temporary meditative or mystical experience. Non-duality, I think, is especially important to study, and increasingly so, um, because anything with the potency to heal can also have side effects. Um, Non-duality may involve loss of self, which could be misunderstood or pathologized in a Western European, white European context. Um, meditation and mindfulness are increasingly popular, evidence-based therapeutics. And 91% of the non-dual claimants in my study report having used meditation. Um, there are increasing numbers of people now claiming this state. So we do have uh, sufficient numbers of people to do empirical investigation on. Um, previous empirical research on this in this space, um, much of it has been qualitative. Um, most of these scholars here um, were doing research for their PhD dissertations. And I just wanna say thank you <laughs> um, because they provided a lot of testable items with that qualitative research. Um, there's also been some neuroscience um, efforts in this space. And then of course, uh, Jeffrey has administered a large number of psychological measures. Um, there are scholars now starting to ask if depersonalization may be related to self-transcendent experiences. That was Yaden, Haight, Hood, Vago, Newberg. Um, and depersonalization, is it related to meditation? But no publications to date have systematically explored whether non-duality is statistically related to these constructs. So depersonalization, obviously this is a, this is a very Western um, you know, concept or, or definition from the DSM, detachment within the self regarding one's mind or body and being a detached observer of oneself. And the DSM lists several symptoms, numbing of emotions and bodily senses, feeling unreal, things seem unreal, altered bodily perceptions and distorted sense of time. Dissociation um, and dissociative disorders you know, of various degrees involve experiencing a disconnection and lack of continuity between thoughts, memories, surroundings, actions, and identity. And the DSM lists memory loss, feeling detached from self and emotions, distorted perceptions, significant stress and inability to cope, and mental health problems at the extreme forms, depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. Um, so the purpose of this study is to, was to survey members of seeker communities to determine whether people claiming non-dual experience might score higher than non-claimants on these, these tests. The null hypothesis was that there would be no difference, no significant difference between the two groups, both in scale scores and in percent exceeding clinical thresholds. Uh, I was able to recruit 312 people to complete the survey. They were from four groups, uh, two Buddhist groups, a secular group, and a Western contemporary spiritual group. And these groups were specifically focused on non-duality or spiritual awakening rather than general spirituality or general meditation. 41% um, uh, of the participants were female, 59% male, um, from a wide variety of practices, and 36% wound up being non-dual claimants. The measures that I used, uh, the Cambridge Depersonalization Scale um, is the, you know, the standard scale for this, this, this construct, 29 items measuring frequency and duration. Uh, the clinical threshold of concern is a score of 70 out of 290, um, but those with depersonalization disorder diagnosis score at a 113 or higher. The dissociative experiences scale has 28 items, clinical threshold of 30, and you can see the, the various scores um, that 
are represented by the general adult population, anxiety disorders, dissociative disorder, dissociative identity disorder. And then the mental health continuum the third test that I, that I included was designed as a comprehensive measure of mental health, hedonic, eudaimonic, social, and psychological well being, but it was also designed to be a cross check against tests of disorder. Um, you know, someone can have symptoms of something and not be in distress or disorder. And so I made sure to include this as a check against that. This was the way that I categorized the participants. I simply asked, are you non-dual? And I presented the, the, the working definition. Um, people who checked no or not sure, I counted as a no. And I also left a comment box um, under the question for people to provide their own, their own definition. And I'll be uh, sharing that, um, those responses in my dissertation. I don't have time today. The procedures. Um, they were recruited from uh, seven groups. I, I solicited seven groups, but four, only four participated. Um, it was collected via SurveyMonkey, downloaded, cross-checked. I just download, downloaded my data on Monday, so I don't have time to analyze all of it. I, I gave participants a lot more tests than just these three, um, but just today I'm presenting, I'm presenting the three. It was a cross-sectional design, just taking a snapshot of people who claimed versus you know, didn't claim rather than, a, that rather than a pre or post or a longitudinal design. And so here were the results on the test for depersonalization. Um, the, the null hypothesis was obviously rejected. The non-dual claimants in the gray box here did score significantly higher. And they did score above the, the clinical threshold of concern. Um, so this is, um, you know, this is an interesting finding. Uh, needs a lot more digging. Um, as you can see, the non-dual participants, um, people who, who, who classified themselves as non-dual um, were above threshold 19% of the time. Um, sorry, this, the ones who said no, that they were not non-dual were above threshold 19% of the time. The ones who said, yes, they are non-dual were above threshold 44% of the time. And so it's, um, the odds of being above the clinical threshold were 3.32 times higher. For the, the diagnosis threshold of 113, um, participants who said they were not non-dual were above the diagnosis threshold 4% of the time. Um, but if they were non-dual, they were above threshold 17% of the time. So if they are non-dual, they were 5.63 times more likely to be above the diagnostic threshold. Um, the, the test for dissociation uh, was also very interesting. The non-dual claimants were significantly, um, scored significantly higher on dissociation, um, but not, um, not above threshold. So these scores, um, if you recall from my previous slide, these are not um, at a diagnosable level, um, but there was a significant difference. Oh, sorry, actually some people did score, a few people did score, not the average, but 4% of the not non-dual scored above threshold and 9% of the non-dual. So 2.35% more likely. The mental health test uh, was also pretty interesting. This was, um, this wound up not being a significant difference. Um, you can see the non-dual claimants uh, scored a little bit higher um, but not significantly so. So they're scoring very significantly higher on a test of depersonalization, but they're also scoring slightly higher in mental health. And um, the numbers of people, um, I don't think anyone, no significant numbers were scoring um, below the, the clinical threshold on this test uh, with a definition of languishing mental health. People were uh, feeling pretty fine. So um, in summary, the non-dual claimants, you know, this is a, there's a lot to unpack with these findings, obviously. Um, here's a summary of those results. Um, and a lot of implications, you know, this is a very, very complex thing. Uh, it might be associated with higher rates of depersonalization and dissociation. Um, should practitioners exercise appropriate caution? Um, is it you know, is it, would it be appropriate for someone with, 
you know, psychological health concerns to be under medical supervision if they're going to undertake a really, really serious intensive meditation practice. Probably a good idea. Um, and practitioners above all should be aware of the, of the full picture. Um, and practitioners can benefit greatly from empirical research just as MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies has really benefited um, the, the field of entheogens by approaching the research in a very rigorous and, and circumspect manner. I, I do have a lot more data to analyze and, and present at a future, a future talk. Um, I also asked people if they classified themselves as awake um, and that produced a slightly different result. The non-dual folks were a subset of the people who classified themselves as spiritually awake, um, but not all awakes classified themselves as non-dual. Um, I gave people a test of memory, uh, prospective and retrospective memory, uh, self-expansiveness, that's my, my PhD advisor's scale. And I also pulled 40 single items out of pre-existing pre research and tested them. Uh, so I'm excited to share that with you at a future date. Um, of course, this needs further, a lot more analysis uh, for covariates, uh, types of non-dual practice, years of study and practice, and of course, you know, any history of diagnosis, medications, et cetera. Um, a lot of limitations to the study. Uh, it was only four groups. Um, I did not survey all of the different non-dual approaches. Uh, there is, of course, self-selection bias in a study like this. Certain people decided to take the survey and others didn't. Uh, there was no community control sample. I didn't test the general population. Um, with these tests, I limited it to a within group study because uh, I was trying to reduce as many external variables as possible. So I was comparing, you know, seekers of non-duality to claimants of non-duality, basically. There are a lot of limitations with measures like this. Uh, Self-report only, no objective measures or third-party reports. Um, you know, people were left with my definition of non-dual, you know, check yes or no. There's always some social desirability bias in these things, uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, and I did notice that uh, when I shuffled the order of the tests, when the depersonalization test was at the beginning of the survey, people scored higher. So that's very interesting. Um, and of course, limitations of the design was cross-sectional and no assessment of changes over time. So there's, there's a lot more research needed. Uh, this needs replication, more diverse samples, community controls, uh, third party reports. Um, it needs more qualitative digging to figure out, uh, you know, I did, I did get a lot of qualitative reports in the comment boxes in my survey. Some people really complained about the depersonalization test. They wanted to be able to check non-applicable. So there's, there's a way that I don't know if that test is really getting at the type of depersonalization that these that these people are experiencing. Um, but since other researchers have been asking the question, I decided to find out. Um, we do need to study you know, group differences uh, and the impact of non-duality on, on daily living. So in conclusion, uh, a study of 312 seekers from four communities found higher scores um, and similar scores uh, to non-claimants in mental health. And there's my email address uh, if you have any further questions. Um, here's a thanks to uh, many people who've helped me along the way. Um, thank you, Jeffrey, you have made a, hu a, huge, a huge contribution in this field that has helped those of us who, who follow you. Um, I see Tim Wilkerson is on the call. Uh, thank you, Tim, for your help. Um, and I will leave it open to any questions. <laughs>